Okay, welcome in team. Rob Mountford here with you again today. Uh, thanks so much to all of you who have joined us over the level four lockdown period. We're now of course in the first week of level three, so hopefully we're all heading back to some form of uh, normality, whatever that will be for us all. Um, we've really enjoyed putting out the webinar series so far and we'll certainly be con continuing with them However, we'll likely be putting out around one a month from now on, so we're not bombarding you uh, all with an overload of information. Righto, on to today's webinar, where John Kilby is joining us again uh, to present on the protection of wood by coatings. Now, for those of you who tuned in last week to our webinar, where John presented on exterior steel, you will have no doubt heard my intro that covered his extensive training and qualifications in the area of steel and corrosion. I mentioned in that intro that John's main role at Resine is business development with Resine Coatings Technologies, which is the part of our group that works on innovation along with much of our export market and bulk factory applied products here in New Zealand. Much of Resine Coatings Technologies focuses on the timber coatings and John is a leading specialist here at Resin on all things timber. Again, we won't be answering questions live today as there's a lot to get through. However, as always, please do type them into the question area. We do keep a record and we will come back to you directly after the webinar. Today's presentation is also available in the handouts area uh, for download and will be uploaded onto the webinar area itself on our website. So without further ado, I'll pass over John now to crack into things. All yours, John. Thank you, Rob, and hi, everybody. Um, great to see you all again, and let's move forward with this presentation. So just so you know, this is a one-day presentation that I put together for our staff, and I've tried to squeeze it and shorten it dramatically to get it in within one hour. So we'll do the best we can, and we will move forward. So. Um, that's me, been in the paint for quite some time, 35 years. And even though steel is my background, I have a lot of information and uh, work around timber. So the purpose of this presentation today is to overview the basics of wood and its structure and timber protection by use of coatings, during which we will look into the performance and what to expect during the life of that coating as well, all right? So today we are going to cover inside the tree, softwood versus hardwood, early wood versus late wood, cutting the log, timber movement, cell penetration, why we actually coat timber, bare timber exposure, options to coat, effective angle and exposure, paint splitting, and some brands literature. So a little bit to cover. And it is in a order or chronological order so that we can really understand, we need to understand timber before we can understand how coatings and oils and stains actually work on it. Now on the right there, there's a tree. I know that sounds pretty obvious, but it's actually a really good picture because a couple of things. Trees are natural. They're not processed like we can make jib board or chip board or all those sorts of things. We're dealing with a natural product, so always remember that. And it's got roots and leaves and branches and all of that. But we today are only actually interested in the trunk part because it's the trunk part that we chop up and make all of those different profiles of timber that we love to use. Just a quick one on timber. I'm not going to get all green on you, but they are full of carbon, so that's a good thing um, to be able to use timber in any way we can. And we grow lots of it in New Zealand. <coughs> So <clears throat> let's have a look inside the tree. So I've got a slice of the trunk here for you. And it's important we actually understand what it's made up of. So first of all, in the middle of the tree, we've got what's called the heartwood. That's usually the darker bit when you look at the end of the log. And it's what it is, is the sapwood, which we'll get to in a minute, that is being clogged up with resins and gums and other extractives. It's like a backbone for the tree, but as the tree grows outwards, the center of it starts to clog up and you don't get a lot of movement in there. So they're really non-active cells that don't do anything, but they do help support the tree. Then you've got the sap wood. When you think of it, look at the names of it. It's the part of the wood which the minerals and water are transported from the leaves and the roots. It also stores nutrients and helps support the tree structure as well. 
growth rings. I know you all know that, but every year, the tree grows, it has a dark line and then the lighter bits in between. So the growth ring is made up of early wood and late wood, indicating one year's growth. And each year more wood is added and trees grow. They might grow up, but they also grow outwards. All right. Bark and the underlayers of bark. So bark, think about it, it's the outer cover of the tree that provides insulation against temperature extremes and helps keep the wood from drying out, helps protect it from some, some forms of attack and UV and weather, you name it. So bark's a pretty important part of the tree. And rays, now they're interesting because you can see those sometimes. They're actually tubes that go at a different angle. You know, your straws will go up and down the tree, or your water goes up and down, but these go at right angles to that. What it means is it's a, it's a tube that can carry nutrients through the wood and also be used as a store. So that's how they can easily move it sideways in the timber. Now don't forget when you cut timber, they're stuck in the wood as well. So, And then you've got the pith, that's a little pulpy bit in the right in the middle, and it can help store and transport nutrients throughout the tree. So there you go. So that's a bit of a cross section. There's a little bit more to it than what you think. Now I talked about, um, some people talk about softwoods and hardwoods, and um, hardwoods aren't necessarily hard by the way, because balsa wood is actually a hardwood, so there's something interesting for you. The main thing I'm trying to get across here is the difference between a hardwood and a softwood, is its actual cell structure, they are different between the two. So on the left there, that's a bit of quila, or for anybody in Australia, it's merbau, same stuff, different name. And you can see all those pores in the timber, and it's hard to see growth rings in there. Whereas this one's a bit of pine, it's just been sawed chopped in half, so it's not as good looking, but you can distinctively see the growth rings, and that cell structure is definitely different to that of hardwood. Right? So there's some fundamental principle differences between softwood and hardwood. And from a botanical point of view, of course, they're different and they have different leaves and seeds and all of that sort of thing. So we're not going to get into all the science behind that, but there is a difference between the trees and how they grow and how their cells and cell structures are together. Now, we talked about those rings between each year, and the top photo there is a cross section of a piece of wood, and you've got dark lines and light lines in between. So this here is the early wood, and you can see that the cell structure is rather large and open. <coughs> and the darker areas, which is the distinctive ring mark on a tree, is your late wood. Now you can see those cells are a heck of a lot smaller and much more denser. So there's a density difference between those two areas. There's a volumetric difference in between those two areas. Um, there's a hardness and softness difference between those two areas, and that's all in one piece of wood. So early wood is what we call spring growth. So it's more open, easier to penetrate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The late wood, which is the bits that grow in summer and autumn, are a lot smaller and denser because it grows a lot slower during that time. You know, in spring, all the plants will bounce out and start growing really fast. Well, trees do the same thing, and then they slow down in your summer autumn period. Of course, nothing happens in winter. So. I can show you an actual physical photo of some timber that was band sawn. And you can see here it is here that the bits that actually tear and lift up are the early wood sections. And you can see the late wood because it's so dense that the band saw can't really cut it very much and it just stays hard and dense like that. So you can get some distinctive differences in your wood surface. <clears throat> and that will affect the penetration of stains and that sort of thing because of the cell size and the density difference. And we're going to look at that in detail later. So we've looked inside the tree and we've looked at the different bits and pieces. Well, let's look at um, how we cut the log. So we're looking at the log end on at the moment. Now it's round. And the interesting bit is that we try to cut square and rectangle sections out of it. So that's going to affect depends where we cut it in the tree, what we're going to get in our grain structure. So let's have a look. So if we take a cut out here, 
called a flat sawn. Sometimes people call it half sawn, but we'll call it flat sawn for today. You can see at the end of that piece of wood, you can see the distinctive growth rings and you can see that pattern on top. Very, very, very distinctive. Now, if we cut this part out of the tree, it's called rift sawn. Now, you can see the grain structure is looking totally different on the end and top and sides this time. So, a very, very different looking piece of timber. And here's our favourite, my favourite, anyway, it's called quarter sawn. So, look at the top of that versus the flat sawn. Totally, totally, totally different, isn't it? There's not as there's those little lines, there's not as much characteristic, etc. However, quarter sawn timber, as we'll see soon and later, is the most stable timber you can get with regards to cupping and movement and you name it. So I prefer quarter sawn wherever I can get it. It's a lot more plainer it's not with regard to grain, etc. But I do like my quarter sawn, especially when we're staining it. Um, and especially because the late wood bands to the denser when you cut it this way are a lot thinner compared to the half sawn, which are a lot bigger. And again, I've got some photos for you to see later. So, so there you go. So that's how and why you get all those different grain patterns in wood because it's coming out of different parts of the tree. If we were to chop a tree and only make it quarter sawn, the wastage, because you, you end up with a whole lot of wastage in between each piece, and it's just too much. So with log prices and quite margins these days, and everybody wants the best wood at the cheapest price, then we get a selection of different cuts out from the tree. But it depends how it's cut, it affects the movement of the timber. So let's look at the log from a different point of view. Here we go. Here's your flat sawn. We call that a tangential cut. Now, any movement, expansion and shrinkage, because wood expands and contracts when you absorb and desorb water. So any movement is greatest along the growth rings. So if you look at the end of that piece of wood, those growth rings go along cross section there. So it's going to move a lot more compared to a quarter sawn, which is called a radial cut. And the movement is least across the growth rings. So from a dimensional point of view, you're not going to get as much movement as you do with the tangential cut. So tangential is your flat sawn boards and radial is your quarter sawn boards. And there is very little, very little shrinkage along the length of pieces of wood. Unlike steel, where you get a lot of movement and shrinkage with heat, etc., and cold along the length with timber is across it compared to lengthwise, very little lengthwise. So you get moisture change with timber during summer and winter and rain and dry and periods and all of that sort of thing. And you can get an easy 6-7% difference. Now as an example, if you had a 200 millimeter wide board and radiated pine, you can see if it's a radial cut, it could move about 1.4 millimeters. But if it's tangential cut or Black sawn, as we've got, could be moved three millimeters. So you can see the big difference between the cuts there on timber. Go down a bit and you can see the cedar, western red cedar, which is imported uh, from Canada. You can see that that has a lot less movement, hence why a lot of people say cedar is more stable. We're talking about expansion and contraction when we're talking about that sort of thing. So different, just different timbers, you're going to have different cell structures, they're going to grow differently. You can just see there there's a bit of difference in movement. Now, two or three millimeters doesn't sound like much, but if you have two tangential cut boards, one on top of each other on the weatherboard, and they both shrink three millimeters, how big is that gap? Well, it's six millimeters, so you definitely see that. So it is rather important. So timber's natural moisture content varies during the year. We sort of hinted on that. An example in pine, it can eat, this is your weatherboards in your house example, it can easily move from 11 to 18% in the summer to winter. So here's a chart, and what this chart is showing is different locations in New Zealand. And by the way, this chart's a few years old. I can't find any, I haven't been able to find a new one lately, but it's the principle I'm trying to get across here. Is So we've got summer EMC, which stands for equilibrium moisture content, so your average moisture content, and of course, 
moisture desorbs from timber in the summer, when it's nice hot in there. And winter equilibrium moisture content where it absorbs a lot more moisture. And just like a sponge, if you wet it, it gets bigger. So it's going to move as well. So let's have a look at, as an example, Auckland. In the summer, it can be 13%. These all averages. In the winter, say 19%. So that's a 6% difference. Now, just for a minute, let's look at Dunedin because this is averages. Summer is 14 and winter is 15.5. One and a half percent difference. The point I'm trying to make here is this is all to do with timber movement. I actually come from Dunedin myself. I moved up to Wellington a wee while ago. Let's just say you move, you had a wooden weatherboard house in Dunedin. You wouldn't be used to timber weatherboards moving very much. But the thing you suddenly you sold up, got a job promotion or whatever, and moved to Auckland. You bought a weatherboard house and all of a sudden you go through a summer and winter and you see your weatherboards move like crazy. And you think, what's going on? The wood's faulty or the paint's not right or whatever. But you need to understand that different environments have different moisture contents, different types of weather, and the timber absorbs and desorbs different amounts, depends on relative humidity, wind movement, you name it. So you need to understand that different places in New Zealand, it will move. And as long as you're allowed to move, and it's designed to move, then you don't have a problem. Look at Alexandra. It's a bit of a difference, isn't it? Nine and a half, ten percent. So, what do these numbers actually mean, and how much will my timber actually move if I that amount of movement? I'll give you an example. Is so, what's happened here is somebody. This is in a weatherboard house that was white, and they decided to paint it a dark colour. And to make it worse, was it was at the end of winter, so. The timber has been swelled quite a bit. And then as summer came along and it started to dry out, so it shrunk, but on top of that, the dark colour sped up the amount of moisture desorption because there was more heat into the timber. So it just sped the process up. So if you will make a statement that tangential shrinkage across a flat storm board is almost twice the radial shrinkage across the cortisol board. We've already seen that. Don't forget you can download this um, later to go over it again. So let's look at an example. There is a 1% movement for every 3% moisture change below 30% equilibrium moisture concentration. Right? So in Auckland, that would make a 140 millimeter wide board that was flat on, could shrink 2.8 millimeters. Now, that doesn't sound a lot, but remember, if you have two flat sawn boards, one on top of each other, and they both shrink 2.8, it's about a six millimetre gap. So it's a big issue, and you'll get gapping, as you can see in that photo on the left. Now, what some people do, and I do not like this, is, and Brands doesn't like it either, by the way, is they stick no more gaps up the underneath of the weatherboards, because no one likes those little gap movements, and uh, those gap, gap lines, and they make it real pretty. The problem is, is if that board is high in moisture content or at the higher side of the equilibrium moisture content, and then you do that, and then the summer comes along and the boards are going to shrink, it will tear all the sealant out. So it's not only for unsightly looks like that, but we need that gap because wind pressure can push air movement up there and it helps ventilate the weatherboards and reduce moisture build up on the back of the board. So it's healthy for the building to breathe and it's not the best idea to put gaps here with something underneath there. So it's just something to look out for, but hopefully that makes a little bit more sense on timber movement. It's going to move and it will always move. Those that grew up in houses with wooden windows, you always remember the winter time the windows jammed up and in the summertime they were easy to open. So there's an example of wood movement. And here's, here's another nice little picture just showing the different ways it can move it, and cup and warp and twist and kink and bow, you name it. Kinks are very, very interesting. If you look at that one in the middle, what causes it is a slight change in the grain from a knot nearby in the tree and when you cut it it sits there all nicely and suddenly it would just kick off to the side and it's not as bad as of course what it looks on that graphic drawing but it can actually kick down and um, quite dramatically so remember what's natural and we try to the timber mills do the best to cut 
out these defects, but you can't stop all of them. Uh, there are ways and uh, when you can place them on the building that reduces them. So we'll look at that. Now, a lot of you will think that when we put stains on timber, it goes deep into the core, et cetera, et cetera, because you remember Mrs. Marsh's, um, it does get in TV ad for Colgate and um, she sticks the chalk in the water and breaks it in half and says, look, it does get in. Well, that's chalk and this is wood and it's not quite the same thing. So let's have a look. The key thing I'm trying to get across, and we're all going water-based these days, water-based coatings are generally made up of polymers and they're very large molecular chain things like big snakes. So they're large mole molecules. And whether or not they're dissolved in water, organic solvent, or et cetera, et cetera, they, because they're so large, they cannot diffuse through intact cell walls of the timber, whereas solvents and oils are generally smaller molecules, and they can. I've got a graphic demonstration for you to show that. But, so there's some cells of some timber, and if you're very lucky, you might get one or two cells deep, which is, oh, human hair sort of thickness. It's not a lot. Um, and in some circumstances, if you mechanically damage those cells, just through the processing or stresses, et cetera, you can see some cell walls broken there, then the large molecules might be able to snake their way through, just like that diagram there. Generally, the cell walls aren't broken, so you don't get a lot of penetration, and it's not what you actually think it is. Here's some uh, cross-section photos. It's one, for example, and you can look at this one, and we've got a rather large amount of penetration. I personally believe that that photo there has got a lot of broken cells from uh, stresses from within the timber during the processing part. But generally, the coatings will sit on top of the timber. Now, this photo is quite neat because it's actually a paint coating, but there's a couple of things to look at. If you look at that, but how big is that cell? It's quite small, isn't it? And then look at that one there, a lot larger. The paint above it got in because of the broken cells. And look at that, that's part of the one of the growth, you know, the rings, the growth ring of the tree. So there's a cross section of timber. You can start identifying the different parts of the tree when it was growing. So to help teach everybody the penetration of stains and oils and how they actually work, I've done a filter paper stain migration test for you. So if you look here, this is a round filter paper. And what I did is I got some of our water-based stain, our woodsman. So it's an oil stain that's carried in water and it's reasonably fast drying, all right? So, and the color is natural. So it's a tanny browny color. So I dropped X amount and right in the middle. And as it then starts to spread out and penetrate into the fibers of the filter paper, it starts dropping off the heavy colored tinters, and then you can see the orangey stuff now. That's the oils and some of the um, other bits and pieces of the stain continue to penetrate, and right on the edge it goes a light color. That's some of your, the, just the oil itself, and then it's dried and it stopped moving. Now, the next picture is our oil-based, solvent-carrying, church-based, Woodsman stain. So it's the, the solar based version of the, of the same stain. Same color, natural, dropped it in the middle. Now you can see as it spreads, drops off some of the tinter but carries some of it because the, the solvents are very good at dissolving the pigments. And it carries on a lot further than the waterborne. And then right on the edge, you can see that ghosty outline continuing on and it's almost clear. That's actually the oil. So what's the difference between this one and the one on the left is the one on the left dries in half an hour. You can recoat it after a couple of hours. The one on the right takes four or five hours to dry. So when you think of that, if the stain is dried, it's gone from a liquid to then a semi-solid or a solid when you think of it. It's, so how can it penetrate if it's not a liquid anymore? So the one on the right stays for it wetter, longer, more in its liquid form so it can penetrate for a longer period of time. Also, the one on the right, the molecules or the molecular chains are a lot 
smaller than the one on the left, so they can jiggle into these places. So everybody's in a hurry, but if you want something to penetrate a little bit longer to dry, goes a long way. And then the next one is going to be dramatic. That's a coloured mineral oil. You've heard of uh, products like Woodex and um, those sorts of oils. These never dry. So I know the colour is different because I didn't have a um, brownie coloured one, so it was a really coloured one. So I dropped it in the middle. And you can see it started spreading out, dropped off the heavy tinters, carried on, dropped off some more. And you can see when it then goes all clear, it went off the edge of the paper. So that will never dry. I'm going to cover this later. And the penetration that's very, very, very small molecules stays wet forever and just carries on. So you can see a fundamental difference with the penetration of stains and oils. Now you try to put that into perspective onto the piece of wood with all those little cells, and you can see the difference. So when you chop a piece of wood in half, you're not going to see it right in the middle of the wood. Apart from that, we don't want it in the middle of the wood as much. We want it on the outside of the wood to protect the timber. Because Here's a log, and the outer bark, remember, it helps protect the timber from the effects of the environment, et cetera, et cetera. And especially UV light that can cause breakdown of the cells of the timber. But you need to remember, once we mill it, we turn it into building materials, the inner part of the timber, heartwood and sapwood, et cetera, that were protected from the bark, aren't protected anymore. So what we actually do is we take a part of the wood that nature never intended to see the outside world and then we expose it to the outside world. So we now need to protect it because it doesn't have it. And by the way, no disrespect, when we chop the timber down, it's dead, right? It's not alive anymore. So we need to help stop it breaking down any further. So we can help protect the timber from the environment. We need to treat it. And uh, we can also oil it, stain it, or paint the timber. So we're going to look at um, some different options there and um, see what we can come up with. So, with regard to coating options, we can do nothing. Oil it with a vegetable oil, clear or coloured. Oil it with a mineral oil, clear or coloured. Stain it with a film forming stain. Stain it with a penetrating stain. Polyurethane it, or use a solid paint. <coughs> now, I'm not saying that we should do all of those things. All I'm saying is that's your options. What today is about is looking at those different options and their pros and cons, so it'd help you make a more informed decision. And especially a lot of designers and property owners and builders and all that need to know the performance difference of these so they can make, again, a good decision on what to choose. So what are we actually trying to do? Well, we're trying to do all of that, protect it, reduce cupping and nail popping and try to protect it from the sun and splintering and grey and fading and mildew, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we're trying to do because that's what will happen if we leave it by itself. Now, with the following protection option, I'm going to do this as generic as I can to be fair to everybody out there, but it's important to understand each option has its pros and cons. And it's up to the customer, owner, specifier, whatever, to fully understand the properties of the option that they choose. And that's the good points and the bad points. Now, a lot of salespeople love to tell you all the good things. I think it's important to tell you all things, and then you can make a decision. Well, how often do I want to maintain that? You know, if it's 10 stories high on a building and it needs to be maintained every two years, not the smartest idea, unless you've got easy access. So let's have a look. So, if you did nothing, now I'm not going to read all those words because I'm going to give you my own spiel on this. It's a bit of pine on the left and a bit of cedar on the right. So, if you do nothing, you will see that you know how timber goes grey and silver. Well, let's understand how it actually does that. First things first, the ultraviolet radiation starts to break down the lignin part of the cell structure of the timber. That weakens the cells, they can start to split and break open. Weather, which is your rain and moisture and all of that sort of thing, and cycles of it, wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, the water gets into the timber and it can wash out all the soluble pigmentation in the wood. So all of those colours, those pretty colours that make up the wood colour, 
they're actually soluble in water. And once the cells get broken by the UV, they can easily get washed out. So that's why you get the light, the ghosty silver look. Now the black look, as you can see the highlighted bits, that's mold. And what molds are is all the mold spores are around us and you can't stop them. It's nature's uh, recycling system. They're there and the, the timber is full of sugars. And the more moisture that goes into timber, the more it picks up sugars, brings them to the surface, and it's like um, a feedstock for the mold. So that's what we get. Now, I'm pretty sure that most councils don't allow you to do nothing. And the odd area, you can leave the cedar and let it naturally silver. Um, and some people like that. Nowadays, we have nice silver colored stains to help, um, help with that. But that's what weathering does to timber. I don't recommend you do nothing. And uh, a lot of cases, you can't. So you could oil it with a vegetable oil, clear or semi-transparent or coloured. Now, people oil timber and think they're keeping it alive. The wood's dead once you cut the tree down, right? But oil can give the timber a deeper glow and bring out the natural colours of the timber. And that's why people think they're, they're, you know, they're feeding the wood because it, it glows and looks so nice. But vegetable oils, and just for the sake of argument, they're based on plants, you know, linseed oil, rapeseed oil, flaxseed oil, like so. I'm just going to call them vegetable oils. They can act as a feedstock for mold. All right, so that's a problem because they're made out of plants when you think of it, and nature uses mold and rocks and all and fungi to break things down. So these sorts of oils can attract mold. So to try to overcome this issue, they are more highly refined, and then we add a whole lot of fungicides to them especially for outside you need them. Inside it's a little bit different, but outside you need the moldicides and fungicides. So, but these moldicides, fungicides don't last forever, and it being a feedstock, it's not the smartest thing for mold resistance. On top of that, these oils do, these oils do dry or harden over time. It takes quite a long time, but by oxidation, which is a reaction with oxygen, and they start to harden up. So, if you think of it, and they crystallize, etc. So when the timbers expand, they're contracting and moving all the time, then those oils will eventually crack and split, and that lets more moisture in. So it's a bit of a pain. They're usually used in a clear natural finish, and uh, sometimes I put a little bit of pigment in to help with a little bit of UV. Durability, I don't know, six months a year, but I will use them. Well, not outside anyway, inside is a little bit different. Now, not to Prove my point, but just to show you a neat little experiment I did. I got some uh, pine timber, hasn't been treated or anything like that. And then on the left hand side, so there's the bare pine, the middle one is the middle row is mineral oil, the next row is Danska teak oil, which is, which is a processed vegetable oil. And then you've got raw linseed oil on the right hand side. And then as you go down, it's one month, two months, three months exposure. And that's the sort of weather we had. It was quite good, August, September. Um, we had the other one's meant to say November, but it's, uh, sorry, October, by the way, not that. Uh, we had wet dry cycles, so it's really good for the test. Now, you can see on the bare timber that it starts to silver off and gray off because of the colors getting washed out and it grows mold. The mineral oil is actually reducing the amount of moisture getting into the wood, and therefore, so that's why the wood's keeping its color. You can see down the bottom, it has got a little bit of mold growing. Not as much as like the Danske teak oil. You see the mold starts growing at a very early stage here and it just gets worse and worse. And of course, the worst one is going to be the raw linseed oil, catastrophic. So it's just feeding the wood. You can see the oils are reducing the amount of water uptake though, because the colour is not getting washed out as much. So but the mold over it makes it look even worse. So give it once mold around. That's just an example. Here's some more photos. These are actually lab photos of some linseed oil, highly processed with some very high tech moldicides and fungicides. And on the other one is the soybean oil with fungicides and moldicides. Now you can see that they still grow mold, even with all those added materials to reduce the mold growth. And down the bottom is some cedar panels with the same coating on. It didn't grow as much mold because what you need to know about seed down is it's really tannin rich. And those tannins naturally help reduce mold growth. They don't stop it, but they reduce it. It's just an example of if you have plant-based oils, 
vegetable oils, or etc., they can act as a feedstock even when you're processing them quite highly. Now, we're going to talk about mineral oils. Now, remember, they're the ones that don't dry. So you could oil it with a mineral oil, clear or coloured. So mineral oils are petrochemical based. They are very highly refined oils and again, never dry. The advantage of this, remember they're very small molecules too, is that they can penetrate into the timber's cell wall structure. They give the appearance of a surface dry because they're penetrated in, that's why, and provide some moisture resistance making the timber more dimensionally stable. So it just, it's just harder for moisture to get in. It doesn't stop it, but it's, it's harder. So for this reason, architects and cedar timber suppliers love these mineral oils. The oil can have additional fungicides added to it, which we do to help resist some mold growth, and also a small amount of resin to help hold any color pigments we put on it if we tinted the color. So sometimes we like to enrich them with some colors, make the wood look nicer. But also don't forget, if we actually put some pigments with colour in them onto that surface, they're blocking out some of the ultraviolet radiation, so it reduces any of the cellular breakdown. It doesn't stop it, but it reduces it because they're semi transparent. Some UV still gets through, so the colours look nice, it reduces the amount of damage, etc. etc. So, common brand is uh, Wood X. We actually make this resin, yes, it, we do make it, but it's actually made for Hammond Pacific slash Wood X Limited. It's actually their product. We make it for them. So, now, just a couple of important notes with mineral oils. They typically can only be overcoated with themselves and they don't usually accept stains or paint. So, once you put the minerals on, you really need to keep with it and stick with them. So, you think about it if you put many coats of mineral oil on and it all soaks into the timber, and then you paint over the top a few years later and you paint a dark color, say, and you get a really good summer. Some of the oils might migrate back up to the surface again because they're drawn to the heat and uh, push the paint off. So there's an example of that. And because they rely on penetrating into the timber, you put a coat on, you have got to wait for it all to penetrate into the timber before you put another coat on. Otherwise, it'll just run off. And that can take six weeks or it can take a day, a week, six weeks. In extreme cases, a lot longer than that. So just some pros and cons on that. and. But um, 18 to 24 months on north faces and longer, you know, on the east side, the south side of the houses, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There's an example of some uh, wood oils, some mineral oil. That's the Wood X, that's in Queenstown. And what they do do is give the timber a beautiful glow. And there's easy access around that building, so you could easily maintain that uh, timber that you can see in that photo there just using a cherry picker, so it's not overly difficult to maintain that. And um, when we're developing it for Herman Pacific and Woodex Limited, Woodex Limited is part of the Herman Pacific group and their cedar, uh, big cedar in Porter in New Zealand. There's the one on the left is, is Woodex and the one on the right is another brand. And I just wanted to make sure that our performance was as good as, if not better. So that's just some of the exposure data there. Now, these are a little bit harder to get these days and I don't recommend using them, but stain it with a film forming stain, which is also semi-transparent. So let's look at this. So prior to the development of the Woodsman penetrating stains, which we're going to talk through all the penetrating oils in the market, the only stains that were available, I'm talking the 70s and 80s here, or even the 60s and 70s and uh, early 80s. The sort of stains that are available were what we call film forming stains. An example of a common film forming stain, which we call a traditional timber stain, in the heyday was Gold X NF11 for those people that um, remember the days. And um, any other brands of timber stain around then were very, very similar in that sense. These stains were semi transparent, which we're trying to get some of the grain in the timber to show through. But they were based on oils such as highly refined linseed oils, with highly toxic moldicides and fungicides, and a few color pigments. When we applied them to the timber, they didn't really penetrate. Instead, they sat on top of the timber and formed a film. The problem with that is over time, as UV goes through that film and breaks the timber down underneath it, it starts to weaken the <coughs> foundation that the coating is sitting on, and it causes flaking. Um, 
cause massive issues for peeling. How do you how do you prepare it and restain it? And it was, it was just a mess. So I'll show you a photo in a minute. Some companies recently in the last 10, 15 years reintroduced these sort of stains to the market because they have a bit of a shine to them and people were using them not understanding that there is a reason why we don't, well Regine doesn't have film forming stains anymore because they can flake etc etc. Now you get two to five years in longer and sheltered areas so then you could argue that that's quite good but good luck with the preparation of them. So here's an example, here's a couple of examples here and there's a schematic drawing for you. So not all the UV gets through but some does breaks down the timber underneath, the stress from the film sitting on top pulls, and then you start getting your flaking and staining. Now, if you look at that board here, and then compared to this one and this one, you go, okay, well, if I try to sand that back, good luck doing that. And then that one looks fine, so I'll put some more coats on. Well, underneath here, the timber is actually quite damaged. It just hasn't started flaking or peeling. So if I clean that one up and that one, and then recoat the whole lot, not only would it look like a patchwork quilt, but then this one here in the middle actually has a lot more stress and tension because it's got more coats on top, and that will start to break down before the other one do for the next round. So it's just a, it's just a disaster. So I don't like film forming stains because it's how light works and it's how breakdown of timber works. So what we do, <clears throat> There's a lot of you heard of the woodsman type stains, so I mentioned them before. They're called penetrating stains and they're semi transparent to try to let some of the colour and the grain come through on the wood. They're more natural looking stains, they don't have that shiny finish to them. So, and they're very, very popular in the last few decades. <coughs> the first ones we brought out were the solvent based ones, and then we started bringing out the water based ones. So the penetrating stain is designed to penetrate where possible into the very top cell layer of the timber and does not form an actual film as in a varnish or a traditional timber stain or paint film. It is a layer and it sits there. The oils within it penetrate into the cells of the timber underneath. The pigments sit on top and that helps get some UV resistance and some colour, etc. And the mould sides help to reduce mould growth. Not stop it, but reduce it. In some cases, we chuck some waxes in there to add some extra water repellency, okay? Now, the penetrating stains, what's interesting is they don't last as long as the earlier style film forming stains. As the penetrating stains, they break down as by surface erosion, as opposed to peeling and flaking. So the trade-off is penetrating stains are considerably cheaper, which you already laid across, and quicker to re prepare and reapply, with minimal surface preparation, but they don't last as long. So your maintenance is more regular. So durability, say a couple of summers on the north face and a little bit longer on the other faces, e.g. the east and the south. So I'm just gonna show you some breakdowns of these sorts of things so you can understand what you're looking at. And this helps you understand also your timber selection and the, and the grain structure and what finish you want. So the following effects are the same for your penetrating minerals or for these penetrating type stains. Right? <coughs> Sorry, I just need a glass of water here. So brands, even in their maintaining my home, they talk about erosion of penetrating stains on weatherboards and how it is normal and how easy it is to just clean them down prepare, chuck it on another coat, etc. And you can see the causes are UV degradation and moisture penetration and a little bit of mold growth just and e.g. weathering breaks it down over time. But it's very, very simple to put another coat on. Just wash the mold kill the surface. I like soft wash and clean down, put another two coats on. Now I like bandsawn timber finishes and I do not like dress. Some people like the smooth dressed timber. The problem with smooth dressed timber is it's very, very dense surface from the planer processing in the timber mill and the cells are closed. So the stain has great difficulty trying to get into the cell structure. The one on the right is bandsawn, 
tears, just softly tears up the stirpus, breaks open all those cells. So you can see we've got one or two coats on these two samples, put them out side by side, listen for a few years, and you can see the erosion difference between the dressed versus the bandsawn. So you can see bandsawn holds, the surface holds a lot more stain. It <coughs> holds onto it a lot more. You get a lot more evenness in the breakdown. Um, it's just a nicer finish. And most of you designers like a bit of texture to your surface. So there you go. If you do you do dress, your maintenance is going to be much, much more regular. All right. So just think about it. And have a look at this. We'll do, look at this picture again. Remember the late wood bands are very dense. This is like a flat sawn piece of timber, remember? When we had those pictures, they're very dense. So even if you band saw that finish, just so you know, I'm going to go back a bit here. These boards here are quarter sawn. So you can see that they don't have any of that grain running through them. We we'll now look at this and this is flat sawn. So you get more of the late wood band showing up. And you can see how it's torn up with the early bands. The late wood bands are too dense and they're too wide to be broken like that. So when you look at weathering, have a look at the left photo. There's some flat sawn boards there. That's on the north face. And on the west face, you can see the difference in the erosion is not as much as on the north face. A more exaggerated example of what you're seeing in the left photo is on the right hand side. That's on the north face of a building. You see the quarter sawn boards on the right and the flat sawn boards, or half sawn as in the season photo, means the same thing. So, where the stain is on top of the late wood bands that are very dense, it can't penetrate. And of course, the wind has dust particles in it. And when it's windy, it erodes those areas a lot faster than on the more open areas of the timber, which is your early wood part of the timber. So dramatic difference, isn't there? So on that situation, I would recommend that on north faces, you not, not only do band sawn, but you put your quarter sawn on the north faces and it weathers a heck of a lot better than the flat sawn. Some people like that grain look, that's fine, but some people don't. So you've got to talk to your clients. Builders need to talk to their clients and suggest why they want to do, why they want to have band sawn in the first place. It reduces the amount of maintenance you're going to do, holds more stain. Why you shouldn't use flat or half sawn, it's the same thing, on the north face, um, unless you're prepared to do maintenance on a more regular basis. So it's what the stain's meant to do, it's eroding nicely. Now, let's have a look at some differences here. The one on the left is quarter sawn, the one on the right is flat sawn. It's the same colour. So you can see a difference in penetration because on the one on the right it's got those really hard late wood bands that are more apparent and the stain doesn't penetrate into those as much as it does to the early wood. So it's the same colour. So some people say, oh the colour's not right, etc. It's like, well the colour is right. It's just that it looks different on a flat sawn piece of timber than it does a quarter sawn. This is the classic and cedars um, often looks like this. Cedar can go anything from almost white to dark brown. And I know you all say, oh, it's that orangey yellow colour. Well, depends on what part you cut out the tree, it varies quite a lot. So it's the same colour stain, but on different parts of the different pieces of timber, it can look different. So especially with cedar and those sorts of things. And this just does my head in. It is, it's not paint. When you're staining, you can't stop halfway down the wall and then restart again and overlap. Because if you do, you because it's semi-transparent. You're putting on more in one spot than the other with your overlaps, and it's going to look darker. So that's a classic picture on the right at the bottom, and, and a classic example on the left, the difference between one coat and two coats. Remember, it's a semi-transparent, so that some of the light comes through it is dramatic. So you need to start at one end of the timber and go all the way down to the other before you move on. You don't stop right in the middle. And Here's a couple of interesting ones for you. The photo on the left, same stain that's on dressed, and then a piece of wood right next to it was band sawn. 
just as part of the design. Dramatically different. Not only are the grain structures different, there's one's dressed and one's bent so on. So extreme difference in colour. Same stain. And the one on the right is actually some plywood, and that's actually got an oil-based stain on it, so it's quite slow drying. And that's the difference between the porosity difference in absorption between the early wood and late wood bands on the plywood, where it penetrates more in to the early wood, and on late wood it doesn't, so it stains up all shiny. Now, personally, um, that that particular photo, it only looks like that for half an hour a day when the sun hits it. However, they don't like it, and but you need to take those things into consideration when you're choosing stains. We fix that by just putting a coat of the water-based woodsman, the water-based one over the top, and it just because it doesn't penetrate as much and the surface is semi-sealed, it evens up the surface. So we, there are ways around these things, but some people like that grain look, so it depends what you like. Now Polyurethane, don't do it unless you've got a yacht from etc. But let me explain. If we put a clear coating over the timber, we're talking exterior application exposure here, then the ultraviolet radiation, the UV from the sun, can penetrate the clear film, go through it, and start remember to break down the lignin within the cell that weakens the timber, and then the film on top starts pulling as it does, and then it starts flaking. So the ways we try to reduce this damage is we put a lot of you special UV absorbers into the clear coatings. They're expensive, by the way. And then that's why the yacht varnishes are a lot, and door varnishes are a lot more expensive. And then we apply many coats, so five to seven coats. What we're trying to do here is build up the thickness. So from a cross-sectional point of view, the amount of UV absorbers available within the film matrix is a lot more because when you, can, when you think about the sun trying to go, the UV rays trying to go through it, they got a longer distance because there's more coat, so there's more chance that they'll get absorbed into some of those UV absorbers. And sometimes we also put transoxide pigments, they're the yellow in appearance. So often you'll see some of those exterior varnishes have a yellow tone to them. It's these little transoxide pigments that we put in, they're very good at absorbing the UV spectrum. So that's why sometimes those varnishes look like that. They do work. They don't stop all the UV, so it will fail by splitting and cracking and peeling. <coughs> just like the film forming stains we talked about. So if you really must do it, just you've got to use the yacht varnishes and the door varnishes, but be prepared to strip it all up and do it again, because here's some examples outside. See the photos on the right have that honey colour to them? That's the transoxide, but that's after not very long actually, those ones. Not my product, by the way, but that's just some examples of breakdown as expected. I wouldn't expect anything less than that. So, not very nice looking. And you mentioned trying to the amount of work involved. Probably took five minutes to put the varnish on, and it will take two days to prepare it and redo it. So, what a mess. Of course, we can use solid paint. Now, think about it pigmented paint provides a solid film and it makes it opaque to UV light, so it helps protect the timber from the damaging effects of the UV radiation. And if we use white and light colours, they also help to bounce out or reflect the heat carrying part of light, which is your infrared radiation. So we're not talking ultraviolet now, infrared, that's the heat spectrum of light. So it helps keep the timber cooler and thus reducing the temperature changes. So if you reduce how hot and cold that timber gets. So a white piece of timber is, is going to not change a lot compared to a dark piece of timber painted black or something like that between the sun coming out and going down at night time. So and that during the time is desorbing a lot faster. So the lighter the colour, the less heat they can absorb, the better. Don't forget sharp edges need to be removed from timber. This is in all cases to especially with film forming coatings because it pulls back during the application when it's wet and then you don't get the right things on the tip. I'll show you, show you an example of that. So in just a rule of thumb, I'm going to chuck this in there. The more gloss, the better the flexibility of the paint job. Now, a bit of a loose statement, but I like your semi-gloss type finishes. They give it a bit more resistance, etc., a bit more flexibility. Um, it's a personal choice, but uh, most of our paints we use for timber outside still have some flexibility built into them could we need to because the timber's moving all the time. So there's some timber and there's a UV bouncing off. The one thing that 
Additionally, a paint film will do is it slows the water vapor movement into the timber and out of the timber. So you don't get as, as much sudden movement, which can stress and split the timber more so than um, like with stains, with paint, it does it a lot less. So if you've got a bit of a barrier there, it does help. Right, so let's almost finish. I need a few more minutes. Let's, let's look at another potential exposure and breakdown. This photo was supplied by a colleague of mine, and it's a brilliant example to use for learning. So you look at these weather boards and look at these ones here. They're 90 degrees to the sun and they're fine, but look at these ones. So when we change the exposure angle, we actually get more sun and weather and everything else just by changing the angle. So that's the same paint on the same house and the same exposure and the ones that are angled more get twice as much weathering as the ones that are straight up and down. Shocking. But real photo, and photos don't lie in this case. Now, you all know a rusticated weatherboard. Well, let's have a look here. Here's one. So can you see that as you curve and change the angle, it gets a lot more exposure. So a lot more weathering on that bit, and that, but there's something else going on here too. There's a drip point where water builds up on this area, and that's caused by a sharp edge. And remember I said that when you put paint on, it's in liquid form and has surface tension. And if you have a sharp edge, it pulls back. So you've got less film there. Now, as that board expands and contracts, if you've got less film there, it can easily split because the paint's not as thick. And if it does that, once it splits, as you can see just there, then water can get in underneath the paint and lift it off. And if you do that, then you can get dirt, and molds, and etc. to grow. So, Quite dramatic picture that. Just so you know, this photo, and I do know where it's from, um, it wasn't our paint. I'm not defending it, I'm just saying it wasn't our paint. It was a low flexibility paint. It was only put on a third of the thickness it should have been. And then on top of that, you have a sharp edge problem. So they put a bit more paint on and just gave that edge just light sand. They wouldn't have had that problem in the first place. Let's look at another one. Now, what's interesting, I'm going to call this not sharp edge, but I'm just call this grain splitting. So let's have a look at this board as an example. And let's look at the split here. That could be the late wood band. And then here is the early wood. And then once we get a bit of moisture into that wood, you know, between winter and summer and all that sort of thing. So the wood, expands and those early wood and late woods also expand but expand at different rates within themselves and can pull the paint apart and just making that little little split from there so again the irony with this one is i know this board and it's the same from the same place as the other photo we just looked at the paint was a third of the thickness it should have been and if it had been put on properly in the first place and the right amount of paint put on, we wouldn't have had this problem. But it's just interesting that you think of it, now we actually understand timber, we saw when we chopped the tree down and processed the log and everything else, that the different grains, and the different parts of those grains do affect long-term and everything builds together for these sorts of things. And you can see also why if I had quarter sawn, you've got less likelihood of that as well. Uh, but don't forget, quarter sawn timber can be a little bit more expensive. Um, so if you don't believe everything I've just said, then go to Brands and buy all those books. And that's only a very small selection of what's available. I'm not promoting Brands. They didn't ask me to do this, by the way. What I like about these books is they're very, very good for everybody to read um, to help decide what sort of timber cladding you're going to use, what sort of coatings you're going to use. And all of those things I said about the mineral oils, the vegetable oils, and the paints and the stains, that is actually covered in the Good Practice Guide Exterior Coating by Brands. So if you want a generic, well-respected company to look at rather than a salesman or something telling you the stuff, though those books will tell you the same thing I've just told you in the show. So look at, they have a lot more books too on all sorts of concrete and bricks and all of that. So especially for the designers and architects out there, is maybe you get the whole selection for your practice and um, Sure, they'll give you some discount. 
and uh, it will be good, especially for the young people coming into your practices and trying to have a look at them. So let's look at the overview. We looked inside the tree, and then we looked at softwoods and hardwoods and early wood and late wood. We cut the log up and we looked at the timber moisture movement. And don't forget it's going to move. Cell penetration and the difference in the density, why we actually coat timber, what happens if we don't. The different options, which we can now choose which way we want to go. Effect of exposure and angles, north face, south face, 90 degrees, 60 degrees. Paint splitting and breakdown, etc. and a bit of brands literature. So that's me and I'm only one minute over, so I do appreciate you coming and joining me again. So that's the end. Thanks for your attendance. Go well and everybody stay safe out there. Over to you, Rob. Thanks, John. A super interesting presentation there today. I'm um, hoping that there was plenty in there. I'm sure there was plenty in there for our uh, attendees to take away. So just a note, guys, uh, the webinar will be on our website in the next few days, along with John's presentation um, and available at any time for you to download. As mentioned, any questions that you've asked today as well, we'll, get, we'll come back to you. There's been quite a few coming through, uh, so we'll come back to you directly and answer those in the next day or two. So thanks again, John. Very much appreciate that you've taken out time over the last couple of weeks to present for us. Um, both presentations have been, been outstanding. That's how it's done for the day, folks. So all the best, stay safe, and bye for now.